This video tutorial will look at decision trees. Now decision trees are actually something that we look at subconsciously on a daily basis and one example of this is shown in the game show Deal or No Deal. In this game show our contestant, in this case has got box number 10, has options of boxes to pick from with varying amounts that could be inside. Now they don't know what's inside and at this stage of the game I think our player has got left either one pence in their box, ten pounds, £1,000 or £250,000, that cool quarter of a million top prize. Now we don't know what's inside and the player doesn't know what's inside and so they're playing a game trying to work out what might be in there. That's going to be their prize but at any point they have an option. They can either keep playing and whatever's in the box at the end is what they'll take or the bank will ring them and offer them a sum of money at key points in the game to try and encourage them to stop playing and take their offer um, or to keep playing. So at this stage, with our four sums available, the bank offers us £50,000. So based with this, would you prefer to play on for the four sums that could be in there, of course only one is, or to take that £50,000? Well, the decision tree will actually show us the answer to this. I'm going to come back to it at the end of the video to show you what the decision tree would suggest your option should be. So the decision tree is a quantitative decision-making tool. It looks at numerical data to come up with a final and very definitive answer. Businesses use these all the time, decision makers make them use them all the time, so it will give you the idea financially which is the better of two, three, possibly more options. So for example, should we to increase our profits, put on a sale, or should we keep prices as they are and advertise more? The decision tree will give us the answer to this question. Let's have a look at a decision tree in context. We have a business which produces and sells crisps. Now, they want to increase their profits and they have two options that they've come up with. They can only afford one investment and these two options essentially would, would absorb that money. So the first option uh, to increase their profit is to focus production on organic handcrafted crisps. So perhaps there's a market there where we could gain extra revenue, hopefully lower costs, uh, to increase our profits. Option two is actually to maintain how we produce our current production methods, but maybe go for some quirky flavour crisps, something a bit different, and develop our USP that way. So we're going to build a decision tree to see which of these two options perhaps would be the better. So our decision tree structure would look a little like this. The box you can see on the left is what's called the decision node. You don't need to know this, but it shows us essentially a question has been raised at this point that we need to answer. The lines coming from the box show us the number of different options we could take. Now I showed you two possible options previously. We could go for organic crisps, which I'm going to colour code yellow for this example, or quirky crisps, pink, as being our two options. And we can't do both as one or the other. Now there is always a third option when we look at decision trees, and a business can decide to do absolutely nothing. Showing brackets underneath those labels is the cost to the business of actually pursuing that particular approach. So organic crisps will cost us £18,200, quirky crisps £22,750. Doing nothing, well we maintain the status quo, it won't actually cost us anything in this example. The figures are in brackets because they are a cost to us rather than a revenue and that's important later on. So there's various things we need to find out to complete this. So the business will go away, they will perhaps look at previous sales data to see how they might have done on these options. They may look at competitors to see if they've launched similar products and how well they've done. They may do primary research, asking customers what they think of their options. There's a range of bits of information they could collect. Again, anything that's pertinent to this particular decision. One of the things you might want to have a look at is actually how much experience this business has in other areas, certainly if you're applying this for case study. Is this an area they're familiar with? And that'll give you some information about the data they're collecting and perhaps the quality of that. Again, we'll come back to that and start to evaluate this method later on. So we've gathered some data. Now, something key to decision trees, which I'm going to introduce now, is the idea of probability. This is something that mathematicians will be very familiar with, and certainly if you studied maths up to GCSE, you would have looked at probability. Probability of something is how likely it is to happen. And probability is ranked from zero, it is not going to happen, it's an impossibility, uh, up to one where actually something is a definite. So for example, 
a probability of zero is that living in the UK, I'm likely to have a volcano appear in my front garden tomorrow morning. That probability is zero, or at least very, very close to zero. If you like, the percentage likelihood is zero. Now the chance that the sun's going to rise tomorrow morning, at some point, it's getting into the winter now, so it might be a bit later on, um, it comes up every day, always has, I don't expect it to be different, the probability is closer to one, it's 100% likely to happen. You'll see it's similar to percentages, but we just don't multiply by 100. The probability of one is 100% certain. Anywhere in between, therefore means that that's different levels of certainty on that. So probability of 0.9 is quite high, probability of 0.3 is quite low. Now for our decision tree, the key thing is that there's a certain outcome of some sort. It may be good, it may be bad, it may be indifferent, but there'll be some outcome. So if we do have different options, their total probability of one of those happening should be 1. So therefore we'll probably find that if 1 is 0.3, the other might be 0.7. Our two different events might be 0.5 and 0.5. They must add up to one, no more and no less. And you'll see this on the following chart. So now let's consider the probability of our different options. So for organic crisps, we now introduce what's called the chance or outcome node. So with this, this shows us the possible options that we could get from taking this course of action. In this instance, we've got three possible outcomes. We might see high sales, as a 0.4 probability of that a medium level of sales, which is again 0.4 probability, and we could see poor sales, 0.2 probability. Notice how adding together the options we have, and we have three options, the probability adds up to one. One of those is certainty. 0.4 plus 0.4 plus 0.2 is one. Now looking at our quirky crisps, our different flavours, adding USP that way. Again, I've expressed it slightly differently. We don't necessarily have three options. We could have as many options as we please. Typically in the exams, they're not going to give us many more than three or four outcomes that could happen. Here I've shown that we have success or failure, so rather than high, medium or poor sales, we have success or we have failure. So success of quirky crisps uh, could be 0.3 probability. Failure of that could actually be 0.7, so it's probably more likely based on that to be less successful. Doing nothing, well, there's only one outcome from that, it's going to be exactly the same as it was before. So therefore, there's a probability of 1. That's the certainty of outcome. To help us to quantify, we can then look at what that might mean. So high sales might mean £68,000 additional sales revenue. Medium, 41000 And poor sales might be just an additional £17,000 worth of sales revenue. So the quirky crisp success might be worth £72,000 to this business. That's quite significant. However, failure could actually be a loss. We could actually lose and damage our existing reputation, so therefore lose sales of our existing products. We might actually end up being worse off. If we do nothing, the value of that will be zero. So let's have a look at the expected value of each of our options in turn. Now this actually looks at the weighted level to actually give us a total or an expected value that we might have from taking one of the options, in this case organic crisps. So we're going to multiply the probability by what we expect that benefit might be. So let's see how that looks. So in order, so we're starting with our first option. So high sales, 0.4 probability times 68, plus 0.4 of 41, plus 0.2 17. And you'll see here, extra weight is given to the higher probabilities. So it's only 0.2 times the 17,000 rather than anything else. So that should help, that's why this research is important, to actually get us to what we expect the outcome to be. So that means, on average, the expected value of this would actually be £47,000. That's the result of this equation. So organic crisps would be worth an additional sales of £47,000. Now that's great, but obviously we haven't taken off the costs that we had involved, and obviously our organic crisp option would require £18,000 worth of investment. You can see that under the heading of that option. So the net gain is therefore simply the expected value we have, 47,000, minus 18,000 pounds. So that will give us a net gain of this option of 29,000 pounds. So by exploring this route, in addition to doing what we already do, we would perhaps be 29,000 pounds better off. 
So let's compare this to our quirky crisps. So our quirky crisps will cost us 23,000. Uh, success of those, 0.3 probability, could bring in 72,000 pounds. But failure, slightly higher weighting, 0.7 probability, would actually mean a loss of 8,000. As we said, perhaps lost image, etc. So let's add these together and see what we get. So our expected value of the quirky crisp option, 0.3, which is our success, times 72,000, plus, in this case we're plusing a negative, so we're going to minus 0.7 times 8,000. You can write this as plus 0.7 times negative 8,000. That actually gives us an expected value of 16,000 pounds. Again, it's pulled very much to the lower end of the scale, so 72,000 pounds if we were successful, but the higher probability of failure brings that figure much closer to the loss that we could be making. Now the net gain of picking the quirky option is not quite so good. Unfortunately that expected value was quite low. Because it was £16,000, once we take away the cost of £23,000 exploring this option, that actually would make a net loss. If we explored the quirky crisps in the way that we planned it and we've researched it, that actually would be worse off. We're probably better to do than do nothing, because actually we would lose nothing, but gain nothing. So let's summarise. So our decision tree has shown us our three options. To take the organic crisp route, we'd actually have a net gain of £29,000, as played out in yellow. Our quirky crisp would actually be a net loss of £7,000. Unfortunately, the failure here could be very costly. And doing nothing, well actually, there's no net gain from this. It means doing exactly the same. You can do the calculations, but you'll see uh, at all stages the cost is zero and the revenue is zero, so there'll be no gain and no loss. If you're drawing a decision tree, a really good piece of practice is actually to show the options you're discounting by putting a double mark across their lines. This is almost the opposite of decision trees, where you actually use this to show your critical path. In the decision tree, we're actually saying these are the options we're not going to take. So for quick reference, you can now see that we would probably suggest the organic crisp route as being the one which is probably most beneficial. So let's sum up what we've found and see kind of what the pros and cons are of decision trees that we can use to evaluate. The advantage are it does give us a clear decision. Anything with a net gain over zero pounds is worthwhile. Obviously, the higher the better. Net gain of a pound or two might not be worth doing because, again, we're relying quite a lot on the accuracy of the data we've gathered. It also requires us to consider all the different factors. Anyone taking the decision actually has to undertake research so they can actually, with some confidence, predict the probability of different outcomes, for example, different levels of sales. So it does require and forces research to be undertaken to actually ensure that this information is reliable. All outcomes need to be considered, and obviously, again, it will highlight this because it's a very methodical approach. It will actually show the things that we have to look at and things that we need to consider. And if it's based on well-researched, accurate data, then it can actually show quite a sound outcome. Certainly, if a business is taking quite a routine decision, something that they've done before, where they've got a lot of research, a lot of experience already, uh, and actually proven results, then actually probably we quite sound in terms of the information you're using, so it might be quite accurate and quite a useful tool. And finally, it allows us to base our decisions on data rather than instinct or hunch. This is really unambiguous. It will give us a very definitive result. It's very rigorous. It's a scientific approach to making a decision. So therefore, it's likely to be more accurate, more reliable. There are disadvantages there. So it does rely on that accurate data. It could be quite difficult, certainly in a volatile market, or in a market where a business has very little experience, to actually get hold of or generate useful information and predict reliability um, and probability accurately. Certain things such as probability make a big difference, as you've seen, and how do we know that an increase in sales will be X amount, or success or failure will mean a certain value. So it's quite hard to actually come up with that information, certainly if there's lack of experience. Decision trees rely on what's known as compound unknowns. So, for example, the decision we had before could actually be part of a much larger decision tree where actually compound outcomes are linked together. If there's any error in this data, then of course it's going to be magnified as we move through. Thirdly, the decision is quantitative. 
it doesn't think about other factors. For a business that wants to establish a very high prestige image, having a sale might be quite a good way to increase revenues in the short term, but it would damage the image and reputation of the brand. So probably not a good long-term decision. So other factors aren't taken into account. And equally, if we have particular aims, there's no basis here in terms of actually thinking about what we're trying to achieve. No weighting is given to that. It's purely a numerical method. So decision trees are good, but again, data, as usual, the issues we have with data remain. So back to our deal or no deal options. Now if you remember, we had four sums of money that were still outstanding. We don't know what's in our box. There's one P, ten pounds, a thousand pounds, and a cool quarter of a million. I hope you've realised there's actually a 25% chance of getting any of those sums. So our calculation here is 0.25 times 1p, 0.25 times £10, 0.25 times £1,000, and 0.25 times £250,000. Probability adds up to 1, we're going to get one of those results. So the outcome to that sum is 62,752. So the options available to us and on average, if we played this over and over again, we would win from this point £60,752. Therefore, if we offered £50,000, so if you're sensible about it, you'd say, no deal.